Hello, thank you for watching this video on applying for university and the UCAS application process. This video is one of a series of different videos about post BL6 options and is intended to be useful for parents and students alike. The main information in this video is all about UCAS and the UCAS application process. The intention by the end of this video is that you'll have an understanding of the overarching process, how it works, what you need to do, um, how parents can support students and um, more information about how to actually complete the application form itself. So just a quick overview, there are lots of um, slides with quite a lot of text on in this video, so I'm going to kind of skirt over the information because you can obviously pause and read as you wish um, to make sure that you've got the full insight. Uh, but to keep it brief, everybody applies to university via UCAS. UCAS is the University and Colleges Admissions Service. Here at Brian Lees, we pride ourselves on the fact that we do have a really hands-on and supportive approach um, to helping students with their application, be it from guidance and information about what to apply for, all the way through to the actual mechanics of completing the application form and submitting it. So straight into the deadlines, these are the aspects that are probably most important and the thing that students need to know straight from the offset. We have an internal deadline that we impose, which admittedly is just a chosen point in time. It's not related to the external deadline other than um, we are intending to give students something to aim for, which gives us plenty of breathing and room and contingency time in the event of unforeseen circumstances. So our internal deadline, this is the deadline by which all UCAS applications must be submitted, is the final Friday of term in December each year. And this means that students can go away for their Christmas break um, without having the worries of UCAS hanging over them. And it also means that we've got plenty of time to make sure that we give each student support individually with their application. The actual external deadline for most undergraduate applications is January the 15th in normal years. So that does mean that normally after term, there is a week or two when we return after the Christmas break where technically we can submit UCAS applications. And if we have to, we will, of course, but we're aiming for the internal deadline so that we can only have kind of last minute hiccups to deal with um, in that early January period. Um, so it is also worth pointing out that this is the, the uh, deadline applies most courses to most courses, but not all. Early entry courses, which uh, um, we'll look at on the next slide, and those to conservatoires, which are the performing arts institutions, will have potentially different deadlines. So let's just have a little look at that for a moment. So for early entry, this is courses for medicine, veterinary science and dentistry, or any course at Oxford or Cambridge University. These are what count as early entry, and there is a separate video about early entry if you want to uh, seek that out. Um, they have a deadline that's much earlier, and that is the 15th of October. So all their applications must be submitted to UCAS and by extension to their university um, by the 15th of October. Now that only applies to the choices that are for Oxford or Cambridge, of which they can have one, uh, either or, or there are up to four choices that they'll have to medicine, dent dentistry or veterinary science. Any other choices to non-early entry courses or non-early entry universities still can be added up to the 15th of January, but we'll talk, that's a bit more of a technical detail from the early entry video. Conservatoire music courses have a deadline of the 1st of October and conservatoire dance, drama and theatre courses have the typical 15th of January deadline. All of this being said, it is the student's own responsibility to check the relevant deadline for any courses that they're applying to and let staff know if we need to in order to um, take into account specific circumstances. So the UCAS form then, um, we will, the process is as follows. We ask all Year 12 students to register with UCAS whether or not they're applying to university in May or June of Year 12. So this will be upcoming at the time of recording this video for current Year 12 students. 
What we ask is that all students apply, or sorry, register to apply, just in case, even if they're not considering university. And also this means that we can then have an easy cross check of who, who, who those that need to apply, um, check that they've registered, and it's easy to check uh, against the whole year group rather than specific individuals. All applications are linked to BL6, so this means that a select number of staff who are experts in the university application process can monitor, review and check application forms. We can see the student's application and we can um, approve and cross-reference it, which you'll see more about in a minute. There are three main parts of the application form, which we, we as in, in our view, which is the personal details and admin, the personal statement and the reference. So in terms of the personal details and admin, we give students a double-sided piece of A4, um, which is their bespoke, customised, personalised crib sheet. Now on that sheet, it gives them all the information that they need on how to fill in the personal details and administration section, um, including their ULN number, which is something to do with their unique learner uh, ID, which they'll have to put on. We also give them information and guidance about how to fill in the education section and the choices section too. So this document that we give out to year 12 around the time of registering is really, really important that they keep hold and use it. In terms of course choices then, so the course choices section, you add up to five choices, okay? You can have six if you're applying to a conservatoire and there's a slightly different parallel UCAS system for conservatoire applications. So if you are considering a conservatoire application for a performing arts course, speak to one of us um, and we can help support you set that up. Advice generally, as you can see from those three bullet points, is common sense. Make sure you do your research. Make sure you apply for courses that you are likely to meet the requirements for and if you can, given the circumstances, go and visit or attend any virtual events to get a feel for the institution that you might apply to. Some sources of advice there, fairly obvious. Uh, speak to staff, speak to each other, speak to older siblings or older students that you know and uh, tap them up for information about your potential institutions. There's some websites there as well. Remember to research the entry requirements for your course choices. This is normally going to be related to grades. So they'll have a minimum amount of grade uh, achievement that they will want their applicants to achieve to be considered. But also don't forget that they may, for certain courses, have other requirements such as um, interviews, work experience, portfolios for art and design courses, auditions for performing arts courses. Um, in some cases, early entry courses as well will require pre-admissions tests and it's not unheard of for other institutions and other courses to use those as well. I know that some people that have applied to Imperial this year for maths related courses have had to do a pre-admissions test. This is like a, um, a kind of entrance exam, if you will. Some universities will advertise their entry requirements not in the form of grades, but instead in the form of tariff points. This is where grades are converted to a point system and universities will advertise that they require a set number of points to be able to make an offer. Um, there is a web link here on this presentation, um, which takes you to the page on UCAS that's got all the different qualifications and what tariff points they achieve. You can even get tariff points for things like music exams, so grade eight, piano, etc. you can get tariff points for. Um, typically, universities that require tariff points tend to be for courses that are less competitive, um, but it can still be um, really, really good quality courses that you might be looking at. So if you get tariff points come up on the website on ucas.com on their search directory, then do um, refer to the tariff points guide to, to know what that means. Going on to the education section of the admin part of the form, you will add your existing qualifications and your future qualifications. So for most people, that's GCSE or level two qualifications that you've already been given or, or awarded and you'll input your own grades. We then will input grades for you, predicted grades for you for your level three or A level qualifications. 
Now, we'll talk about predicted grades and how they're formed in a moment, but just be clear that you will add all of your courses and you will need to make sure that you do this as per the instructions on your personalised crib sheet that I mentioned previously. This tells you what year and month to put in, um, what exam boards to put in, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, when you're adding your qualifications. This is one of the areas that students get commonly wrong um, by making mistakes, by not checking the instructions. So please make sure that you take time when you're filling this part out to refer to that crib sheet and you'll most likely get it right first time. We do check all qualifications that are put on. So now we move onwards to the personal statement. So the personal statement arguably is the part of the form that most students take the longest over and also the part that is the most the biggest unknown, I suppose. It's essentially a biography that you will write about yourself, but you must tailor it to why you want to study the course to which you're applying, um, how you're going to try and achieve your goals. You've got to be positive. You've got to really sell your skills, knowledge and experience that are relevant to the course. You can talk about why you're a good student, etc., etc. There is an amazing resource um, on the UCAS website, a video which tells you a little bit about personal statements and how to approach them. Um, this is the sort of thing that we'll want to start writing soon. Um, but I'm going to play you this video as part of um, this presentation. It's about four minutes long, so I'm going to disappear from this little circle for a minute. And I'm going to play you out that video so that you can watch it through because it's an excellent resource. It's scary. You're sitting there, there's a blank sheet of paper, it's in front of you. You've got to fill it up. You've got to talk about yourself. You've got to talk about your interest in the course. But what do you put? This is your future. It's scary. Well, nobody knows you better than you know yourself. You have the opportunity now to show why you're so much better than everybody else applying for your course. So you've got to start thinking about what makes you stand out, but stand out in a good way. I'm Jane Marshall. I work for a university. I spend my life reading personal statements. I read lots of them and I mean lots. That means I know what makes a good personal statement and what makes a bad personal statement. You have to remember everybody's unique. There are lots of different ways of going about it. So this should get you well on the way to writing an excellent personal statement. So where do you start? Well, the first thing you need to do is start getting words down on that blank sheet of paper loads of them, whatever you can think of. Why are you so excited about the course you're applying for? What is it that gets you really excited about that particular course? What floats your boat? Be excited, be positive, don't be negative. Don't say something like, I've always wanted to be a dentist because it's so much easier than being a doctor, because that isn't positive. Focus on the positives. Tell us how you got excited about this particular course. Uh, did you read an article about something? Did it get you inspired? Did you then go and see a lecture from somebody that made you think, wow, I'm so excited, I'm going to write a project on that. That's the sort of thing we're looking for. And you can get all of this evidence from work experience, outside reading, all the sorts of things you do that back up your interest in the course. So throw those examples at the page. Get excited. Once you've got the stuff down about the course, then you've got to start thinking about the skills you've got that would help you cope with that particular course. Transferable skills, stuff like communication, essay writing, leadership, that sort of thing. And you've got to start throwing more words at the page until something sticks. If you're getting stuck, ask your friends and family. They might be able to come up with some ideas. Occasionally they don't. Avoid saying things like, I know I can be an excellent teacher because my friends tell me I'm really good at telling people what to do all the time. Because think about what that's saying about you. Then think about what's exciting about you, what makes you unique. Think of what you do that's interesting, what makes you stand out. And remember, you may not think it's interesting, but somebody else will. You might like gaming, you might like gardening, you might like train spotting. So will somebody else. So get something like that down on paper as well. So, what do you do next? You've got this big sheet of paper with all of these words on it and you've got to get it into something resembling a personal statement. That means you've got to squash it, you've got to condense it. So you need to start off with a really punchy opening paragraph. This is the bit where you tell us how incredibly excited you are about the course you're applying for and that you really understand what it is you're getting yourself into. Then you move on to the middle paragraph. That's the chunky bit. That's full of all the evidence you're going to need to prove your interest in the particular course. You're also going to sprinkle in some of the bits about your skills and good qualities so we know you can actually do it. But that's your middle paragraph. And then you move on to the end bit and that's the bit about the personal touch. This is the bit where you tell us you are unique 
unique. You tell us about the things you're interested in that will help you fit into university life as a whole. So, what do you avoid? Well, the first thing is verbal diarrhoea. You've got to keep focused. You haven't got enough space to go off piste, so make sure you're being relevant about the course you're applying for. That's really important. Other things to avoid, showing off. Don't be arrogant. It's absolutely fine to back yourself up using lots of relevant examples. That's called good showing off. But don't be bad showing off. That is arrogance. Avoid flowery language. Keep it to plain English. We need to understand what you're actually trying to say, so avoid the honour and the privilege of a particular work experience. Just focus on plain English. Avoid cliches. I don't want to see anybody saying, I've wanted to be a doctor ever since I was born. Because you haven't. That's rubbish. Keep it to actual, normal, plain English. Copying. Don't copy. They have some software called Copycatch. It will catch you if you copy somebody else's work. So they're the things you need to avoid. So, just to recap, this personal statement, you've got to show us that you know what you've applied for, you've got to show us how excited you are, you've got to give us examples. Make sure it's a combination though, of head and heart. Be authentic, be focused, but be enthusiastic. That's what we're looking for. You're not going to get it right on the first go, but keep coming back to it. You'll get it right in the end, and eventually you'll have a fantastic personal statement that tells us all about you. So, hopefully, if my technological ability has worked su successfully, you should have just uh, been watching the four minute or so personal statement video from UCAS. So, hopefully, that's given you a good overview of what the personal statement is all about. So, the reference is the final part of the application process, and the reference is written by staff. Now, the way that we do this is we ask each member of staff that has um, either taught your son or daughter or is their tutor to contribute a small snippet and we combine those into a final readable um, 4,000 character reference. And where possible, we'll tune that towards the course that you're uh, applying for. So, for example, amplify the part of the reference that's about the subject area that you're applying for a course for. Um, and further, we will obviously try and make sure that it paints you in a realistic but positive light. They're not like school reports. Um, they are about your capabilities and why you would be suited to higher education. Um, note as well that as part of the reference, we will input UCAS predicted grades. Now, these are different to the normal blue card grades. So the predicted grades are based on being optimistic but realistic. These are formed towards um, the beginning of year 13, based on your performance in year 12 and early part of year 13. Um, they do need to be realistic. We cannot give students A star across the board when they're working at BBB. But what we can do is we can look to see what the student's potential is and we will make sure that we are not putting um, artificial ceilings on what students can achieve. Staff will always have the final say on what predicted grade should be. Um, and students will be made aware of what their UCAS predicted grades are at the earliest possibility so that you know what you can and can't apply for and what's uh, realistic. Do note again, just that point I've made previously, that UCAS predicted grades are very different to the normal roadmap of um, data collections that we have as part of Brian Lee's. The UCAS predicted grades are designed to be um, not what we're saying that you're working at right now at any given point, but what we think your best possible potential will be based on the evidence that we have for you. Once we get to the sending off part, there is an admin cost of £25. This is as of 2021 when I'm recording this video. Um, you pay that by direct debit, um, sorry, not by direct debit, by debit or credit card. And it's the each student or family's responsibility to make that payment. The school don't um, pay and then recharge or anything like that. How this works is that you then, once you've completed the form and paid the uh, admin cost, your form gets put into our internal wait list. Now, it's rather unfortunately named because the process is called pay and send. And students, for obvious reasons, kind of can't shake this idea that when you pay and send, the form goes to UCAS. But that is not the case. The form is just locked temporarily, perhaps, um, but locked ready for approval by us as the centre. 
And we then, the staff that I mentioned before that are experts in the field at checking these forms, will check the form. We will have an individual meeting with each student to go through it and um, make sure that everything's how it should be. And then we will um, send it then finally at that meeting with the approval of the student there and then, okay? But it is still possible for us to be able to send the form or unlock the form for students to make changes even after they've paid and sent. So just be aware of that, please. That's really important. If you do make any mistakes, then it's not the end of the world. Um, it's not ideal, so we do need to try and make sure that they're minimised. But what we would do is a system, once you've submitted your form, a system called UCAS Track is how you, you log into that to be able to track your application. And you can make some changes like your address and your phone number and your contact details through that. You can also add additional choices if you didn't use up all five at the point of submitting your form. Um, but if you've made mistakes that are pretty important, um, like you've put the wrong grades on your previous qualifications, etc., um, or you put the wrong course in, you'd have to contact UCAS and also potentially contact all individual universities. So moving on to what happens next then. So once you've submitted your form, you're waiting really to receive replies. And the replies can come under three broad categories. Um, a conditional offer, which means that you've got to meet the grade requirements. A con unconditional offer, which actually means that you basically you've got a place. Um, but they might now tend to have certain criteria that you have to meet, like finishing your courses. You might also find that you are categorised as unsuccessful, which means you've unfortunately not been accepted for that course and been rejected. Uh, or a course may be withdrawn, and that can be the university deciding that they're not running the course, or potentially you decide that you want to withdraw. Um, there can be some pending statuses um, before all of these are decided, such as waiting for portfolios, waiting for interviews, etc. So you can get an invitation for interview before you'll then receive any offers. In terms of responding to offers, it is um, a deadline for you to reply to your offers is usually early May. So you've got quite a long time to wait for offers to come in and then make those decisions. Typically, you know, once spring kind of rolls around, that's when students are starting to make decisions. And the way that you do this is you select a firm and an insurance choice and you essentially reject all the other um, universities that you may be holding offers from. OK, and those those course places get released back into the pool um, for unconditional offers. If you you only need to do a firm acceptance because you don't need an insurance choice because you've already kind of got in, if you see what I mean. There are some systems built into UCAS that allow for um, students to make changes or apply to different courses after they've submitted their form. One such one is UCAS Extra. So if you are um, finding that you're being rejected from all of your options, you can add additional choices one at a time um, in order to be able to kind of access course opportunities even though you've had rejections. UCAS Extra can only be used if you've had five unsuccessful or withdrawn course options. You can't just add other courses or swap them about otherwise. Clearing is a system that many people have heard of, which is where uh, students who are not holding any offers or who have missed the entry requirements on results day can um, see a list of courses with availability and contact the universities, find out if they're likely to be accepted and then subsequently apply through UCAS track one at a time again. This is something that we support students with on results day if it is something that they have to do um, through not meeting grade requirements for their firm choice or potentially changing their mind about what they want to do. Adjustment is a slightly different system to clearing in that in some cases students may miss meet uh, or even exceed the grade requirements that they originally had for their firm choice and start to look at an alternative pathway. Now if that's you, this system adjustment um, will allow you to contact universities, see if they've got spaces available for courses that you may prefer to enrol on to and then swap your confirmed choice, uh, confirmed firm choice place for an alternative. And the benefit of this is that you hold your firm alternative, your firm choice, your original firm choice, until you've kind of locked in this possibility of switching it. 
More information on adjustment, clearing and extra can be found on the UCAS website and we'll give far more information than I have time to go into um, during this presentation. In terms of results day then, these are the, you know, the kind of flow of what happens. It's normally mid-August. Um, if you meet the grade requirements for your firm or your insurance choice, then as long as you're happy to go to those two institutions, you're in. If you miss your grade requirements, then you should still potentially contact the university oops, and just check with them because sometimes they may find that um, they're going to let people in anyway. You will usually find that out through UCAS Track, which automatically updates on the morning of results day. We will be here. So there'll be, there's always a support team available of um, experienced staff who can advise and guide and support and help call up the universities and, and work on your behalf to find you a place wherever you might want to go. Remember that you've got the options of clearing, you've got the options of adjustment, or if potentially your circumstances have changed, you may decide that you want to leave it and reapply the year after. Again, we will support our alumni with that. So some common issues to be avoided, Attention to detail is really my buzzword here. Just make sure that you follow the instructions that you're given. All students are given plenty of advice about how to complete the form. Um, I've mentioned already the kind of crib sheet. Make sure that you follow that and understand how to do that. Um, get on with the personal statement as soon as you've got a broad idea of what courses you're likely to apply for. Um, I've mentioned, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but most of the time people are applying for similar courses, but at different institutions. It becomes, um, it's not really a thing, a common occurrence for students to be applying for loads of random different courses at different places. The main reason here is that you're likely to be rejected from all of them because your personal statement is um, just one personal statement that gets sent to all of your course um, choices. Some Important, useful information links there. UCAS website is really your go-to. It's where you search for courses, find out all about the entry requirements. They've got a whole course directory, um, excellent resource. Normally it goes live for the upcoming year 12 applicants around the kind of May, June time of year 12. So we'd be expecting that to roll on shortly at the time of recording. Little overview there if you want to pause and have a look at the flowchart from U U UCAS themselves. And then just a reminder really, there are other videos in this series available from myself and Mr. McClellan. Um, there are a general overview video to talk about pathways in general, then there's an apprenticeships and employment video video about gap years as an option and then I've done an early entry application video specific for those interested in early entry and there's also a student finance version as well. So all about how you fund university really and the implications from a financial point of view. If you've got any more questions then obviously contact us through the usual means. Um, I think there'll be a possibility for a follow-up if need be. And also just remember, as I've said previously, to have a look at the UCAS website. You can see here, this is the um, UCAS website. And straight away from the front page, if you go to the courses button, you can find um, an incredible tool, the search tool. Um, undergraduate search tool is, is really, really fantastic and allows you to find out lots of information about applying to university. It's a fantastic resource and um, really everything that you need to know about the application process can be found here somewhere. Okay, thank you very, very much for um, watching and um, hopefully you'll be able to check out some of those other videos too. Take care.